Okay, so this is counter. Uh, bleh. <laughs> okay, this is corporate accountability forums, where we ask questions about power and accountability, and we try to arrive or at least discuss some solutions and basically some strategies and try to move forward from there. And just a few minutes before we got on the line this morning, our esteemed producer, Eric Weinstein, Weinstein was asking me, well, Jim, it's called corporate accountability forms, but for the last many sessions, you just seem to be focused on human capital management. And uh, yeah, I guess so. And that's because that's what I'm interested in right now, you know, but, and you know, and that's, I'm diving into that. I think that is a current topic. It's a good current topic. I think, especially after COVID people started realizing, you know, in the great resignation, there's a lot of people much more focused uh, and the SEC is going to come out with a rulemaking. So, you know, there is much more of a focus there than there has been. And that also takes me back to my roots when I studied employee ownership and all that. So I, I brought in some po folks on employee ownership, but I'm open to talking to any about anything having to do with corporate accountability. So, you know, I welcome your suggestions on speakers and, uh, and also suggestions on, uh, you know, topics and all that. So, you know, please, if you think of something, related please let me know and we'll take it from there uh and you know and also another thing that happened this morning is i got an email from um the assistant of uh who's our speaker next week it's uh boy from the aspen institute uh boy anyway Judy samuelson Judy Samuelson. Thank you, Eric. So, so, uh, and, uh, so she's going to talk about her new book, six new rules of business. And I had ordered that, but I hadn't received it yet. So I'm now listening to it on audible. So anyone who wants to catch up before next week, you can download it from audible. If you can't get it from <clears throat> Amazon or whatever, you know, quickly through the mail. And uh, it's very interesting. I've just started it. But, you know, initially I had contacted Judy because uh, she had written, uh, the Aspen Institute had written something on employees. <laughs> you know, so it was another, it was again, human capital management that brought her into the topic. And she'll talk about that, but she'll talk about lots of other stuff next week. Uh, so our esteemed guest today, our esteemed speaker is Jackie Cook with Sustainalytics. And uh, I've known Jackie for a bit and she's one of my favorites. I sh now I've got a following, uh, who's the comedian from, he used to be a Senator from Minnesota. Uh, but you know, he, he's got a podcast where he says, Every podcast is, this is the best podcast ever, you know, and, he, and, and of course he has to say that forever now because, you know, he doesn't want to leave anybody out. So, but I, I'm sure this will be great. And uh, Jackie has been into the numbers forever uh, at the corporate library and other places. And I think not, that's another thing that is really coming to the fore is numbers and how important the numbers are. And we're seeing that with today's uh, rulemaking announcement from the SEC. It's all about the numbers. And of course, it's about the numbers when it comes to CEO pay and parity and all that. So I'm just going to turn it over to Jackie for a few minutes. Oh, and I also told Judy's assistant, she asked, well, do you, do you have questions for us? You know, do we prepare for, you know, and I told her, well, you know, as I listen to the book and uh, I might come up with a couple of questions for you, but what I, my approach to this, and you know, maybe it's crazy, is that this is more like a dinner conversation. We're sitting around, 
and we're chatty and you know and we have a topic and we might get off topic a little bit and go into other areas but you know that will be the central focus and we'll get back to it and uh and it's a conversation so it's not I, it feels to me somewhat artificial sometimes when people are doing podcasts and you can tell that they have a list of 12 questions that they're going through so this conversation is basically driven by our discussion and you know i encourage each of the people attending this is the benefit of attending the live event versus listening to the podcast or watching the youtube is that you can actually ask questions so uh and i encourage you to do that so jackie why don't we turn it over to you and let's start thanks jim um yes so i so actually i've known jim for longer than jim has known me because when i was a student i was already tracking corpgov.net for the um wealth of corporate governance information that was being posted online in perhaps the first corporate governance website that there was on the internet back in the mid 1990s so um yeah that probably that goes back 20 eight or twin yeah something odd years <laughs> anyway um so it's really uh, great to be here thank you very much jim for inviting me on the, um today and i'm really looking forward to the topic of um today's discussion i mean i i, um, I like jim and and others on this call we share a passion for corporate accountability and um and have come at this from various angles um and this today's topic of conversation will come at this from the CEO and executive compensation angle. I've put some readings into the chat box, um, and these build on the readings that I shared prior to the, um, you know, earlier on that Jim would have shared. Um, and probably we'll touch on some of these today, but, you know, if anyone's interested in some reading, I think that will keep you busy for a while. I'll kick off with a little opening and then I'm really going to open this up to discussion by posing a series of questions that I think will get the creative juices and the, and the discussion going. So um, the topic is um, senior executive pay and the gender pay gap. I'll touch on the gender pay gap, but I think the, the you know, as we look into it, the gender pay gap is one symptom of a of a break in corporate accountability. Uh, and and so I think we can use some of the data around the gender pay gap to examine deeper problems with corporate accountability. Um, so um, from unjustified to exorbitant to scandalous to obscene, uh, many ob adjectives have been used to convey the prevailing sentiment um, that something's wrong with how the top corporate executives are paid. Um, and that is, you know, outside of the team of corporate um, executive pay consultants and the executive class themselves and maybe the boards that um, enable pay. Um, objections range from the unfairness of it all, whether from an ordinary worker's perspective or from a shareholder's perspective, to the overall ill effects on the economy and society. So first of all, is there something wrong with executive pay? Not everybody believes this is the case. And recently I listened to a podcast um, put on by, a, by an executive pay um, consulting firm where the guest argued that the present day CEO pay is really just a reflection of the state of the market for corporate leadership. <laughs> High demand for skilled CEOs, low supply of this rare and valuable expertise. Nothing wrong with paying someone tens, even hundreds of millions if they emerge via a competitive process from a pool of elite with the rarest mix of expertise and experience. This is the standard justification for the status quo, but I feel it's very dark. Um, and I reflect on this by real, by, from the perspective that it offers us no tools or rationale for rectifying a situation where racially diverse executives make up only 8% of senior executives, yet account for more than 40% of the general population, where women only make up 14% of senior executives or the C-suite, um, and yet get and, and also only get 80% uh, of what their male counterparts make. They make 20% less on average across the S&P 500. It also misses a crucial point about the market for corporate leadership. 
and one that Stephen Clifford makes in the CEO Pay Machine. Um, Jim, thank you for the heads up. You know, I had um, I hadn't read the CEO Pay Machine. I still haven't read it, but I have read your review and others' reviews of this um, this book. Um, and ordered it by uh, Kindle, so I think, um, so I've put it into the reading list, but one of the points that really resonated with me was that the external market for corporate leadership, in this case CEOs, is illusionary, illusory. Um, one CEO is not a shoo-in for, for the role, so the CEO class are not an available class for every CEO role, um, and so it makes more sense to think about the internal market for corporate leadership than the external market for corporate leadership. Um, the flaws in the competitive market for corporate leadership position are too obvious, and so I'm going to start from the assumption that we probably all share, and that is that the present state of CEO and senior executive pay represents a severe market failure. It enables rent extraction, which is the payment in excess of value delivered, and a redistribution of value from workers, stakeholders, share, um, shareholders um, to senior executives and CEOs. It not only does this, it also creates market inefficiencies, which undermines market resilience um, by creating perverse incentives, which are often summed up as short-termism. Um, short-termism is at the heart of the global financial crisis, and efforts to strengthen shareholder voting rights following the global financial crisis extended oversight of pay practices. The CEO, the, the say on, um, the, the, sorry, the say on pay vote, which is now into its 12th year as a mandated proxy ballot item, was the centerpiece of the post-global financial crisis shareholder voting rights extension. Yet between 2012 and 2019, average support across S&P 500 never dipped below 90%. Um, in 2020, it inched down and took a little bit of a steeper dip in 2021 to hit 88.4% support average across the S&P 500, enough to sound a warning not proportionate to the outrageous pay practices which have been dubbed pandemic pay plunder by the Institute for Policy Studies that have since transpired um, uh, that, that, um, that many boards enabled through 2020. Pay data shows that CEOs and senior executives' um, pay continues to grow disproportionately to worker pay and household income. In 2020, real wages dropped, household income dropped. S&P 500 CEOs made, 15, made over 15 million on average, <clears throat> a 7% jump over 2019 by the numbers presented in the con summary compensation table, which is a conservative <clears throat> set of numbers if you read the um, if you read the pandemic pay plunder which bases its um, or the economic policy institute sorry study also in the reading list which bases its pay evaluations on realized pay numbers um, so that for, for um, under that calculation the top 300 or the largest 350 companies in the US the jump in um, CEO pay was closer to 18% from 2019 to 2020. Um, the CEO median worker pay ratio extended to 291, 291 times um, the average worker was earned or the median worker was earned by the CEO as reported. Um, there are problems with this metric um, that skew um, it uh, away from or above the, what we might consider to be the real median worker pay number. Um, nevertheless, that represented a jump over 2019. Um, and are those, and, are those yeah. just quick interruption. So <clears throat> are those increasing, you know, like the, the skew or like, are they counting more part-time workers than they were at the beginning or that, you know, if they're, is yeah. it becoming like I remember one thing I remember the corporate and probably you the corporate library reported early on was that after um, companies had to report some oh uh, you know fiduciaries had to vote there was a big push to get fiduciaries voting 
Right. And you saw abstentions increase. <laughs> you know, so yes, they, that's right. They voted, right. but they abstained from voting. You know? <laughs> so, so that's yeah. counting as voting. So are there little tricks that they're using like that here? Yeah, that's an yeah. excellent question. With the pay ratio, um, so the... Um, I think it's the pandemic pay plunder study in the reading list. That's a really uh -huh. good one because what it does is it points out that, you know, there's a lot. So ex, um, boards have a lot of lee leeway when it comes to identifying the median worker. And one of the, you know, the um, one of the immediate impacts of the pandemic lockdown was um, laying off and following workers. And so a lot of that happened before the midway through the year when the median worker might have been identified. So in other words, the median worker, and we know that a lot uh, of the layoffs and furloughs happened, were, were affected on lower paid workers. Right. And so, you know, that, that in itself, just for the, just for 2020, perhaps skewed the numbers, but more generally, um, because of that leeway, you know, um, companies can exclude foreign workers, you know, if a certain percentage of the, if, if, so honestly, I can't think through, or I can't like relate all the conditions, temporary workers or, or contract workers are not included in that. And so there's a, the perverse right. incentive to um, move some of your lowest paid workers to temporary or, um, sorry, to, uh, to contract workers. Right. <clears throat> and that's uh, one of the difficult yeah. things about this. I mean, this pay ratio was very much requested by groups that were, you know, com coming from the, the labor perspective, but then it might have the perverse impact of creating more difficult, you know, creating um, or externalizing some of the workers or pu pushing them yeah. off the payroll. Yeah. So they I, are I really, remember really at Disney, Disney that year, they when they calculated the CEO pay ratio, they they wrote that they calculated as if all the laid off workers were still employed. <laughs> you know, so it's a, but they weren't. Right. You know? so okay, a, well, you know, they, okay, very nice of them. But <laughs> Disney, I mean, when was it in 2017, required all their workers to buy their own uniforms. So it's presumably that was <laughs> included in the median worker pay. Uh. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I mean, you know, there there are because of that leeway, there really are opportunities for companies to, and why you know, so we can assume that that number is skewed upwards right. rather than right. downwards. Right. Um. So others who've been tracking these numbers for longer have have methods for you know creating a standardized measure from year to year, and one of those measures is presented in the um in the one of the readings, the Michel and Kondra reading, um, that's the Economic Policy um, Institute uh, reading, um, and they track this number over a long period of time and and show that the that that this um, well it peaked in 2020. Uh, the 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 um, difference, let's say, between the CEO and median worker, or the median the CEO to median worker pay peaked in 2020, but that was the heart of the dot com boom. It dropped off, but it's peaked again in 20. I mean, sorry, peaked in 2000, and then and then peaked again right. in 2020. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. Uh, so yeah, you know, um, thanks, Jim, because that is an important point. You know, if we are talking about the numbers, we have to be quite clear about what these numbers are. Um, and then, <clears throat> so why is escalating senior executive and CEO pay a problem? So now I've just I'm going to share with you a whole lot of questions that that uh, and these are just questions that I feel like I in our discussion we can um, examine um, but I'll highlight for you where I think some of the interesting um, examination lies um, why is escalating uh, CEO pay let's say a problem pay escalation increases inequality worker pay disparity but also the gender pay gap so in my own research what I've what I've found is um, that the pandemic year opened up the pay gap between male and female C-suite um, employees, C-suite executives. Why, um, is why is this? And I think why is this is really interesting. What I, what I found in that analysis was that it's the share-based pay that was responsible for the for most of the of the widening of that pay gap. 
Share-based pay is a problem. Uh, and I think it's really at the heart of the problem um, of escalating senior executive and CEO pay. I'd love to come back to that, the role of share-based pay um, and what are our opportunity or what are what are the alternatives or, or the strategies as investors? How can we address um, this part of the problem? Right. Um, you know, there's we've and I know um, Jim that you know in previous guests like um, Chief Justice Leo Stryan last week, I, I found his presentation incre incredibly interesting. But and there, you know, the conversation was more at the level of. Um, the economy and the impacts of human capital management on the economy. So perhaps if we steer more towards governance and, and corporate accountability this week, we'll balance that out. Um, but there's, but uh, you know, all of this signifies a deeper problem with corporate accountability. For those of us concerned about re-establishing corporate accountability, there are various possible lines of inquiry. You know, there's the market for corporate, um, there's the, the market culture um, and market failure, the state of the market for corporate leadership. Um, why do we revere the CEO role to the extent that we do? Why have they become such rock stars? Um, why can't they be more like bureaucrats, like European CEOs? <laughs> corporate culture, internal competition for senior leadership. Why do we not see a more active internal um, market for senior corporate leadership? Um, and why does that market not contain more people of, um, or, or more racially diverse and, and um, uh, candidates and um, women candidates? Um, we could talk about the purpose of the firm and the role of the firm in society, um, pay governance and pay structure. You know, we can get into the nitty gritty of shareholder voting rights and the structure of um, senior executive pay. It's uh, opaque um, structure. What can be done? What are the problems with pay governance and structure? Um, where is pay growth coming from and does this help us pinpoint underlying drivers? What is the role of share-based pay? We touched on that. Are we thinking about pay practices in the right way? Are there better ways to pay and incentivize senior management? Are senior management only incentivized with buckets of pay or bank loads of pay? Do we have the right performance metrics? Um, and in another paper I've uh, written, I um, look into whether net zero or carbon reduction or emission reduction targets, can, how they can be incorporated into pay metrics, including pay metrics that um, are used to set um, incentive pay at the senior executive and CEO level. Can we tie executive pay to performance without further inflating executive pay? What are we thinking or how are we thinking about corporate leadership um, or are we thinking about corporate leadership the right way? Um, has say on pay, and this is really, uh, you know, here's where I think we could probably talk for the next few hours. Has say on pay failed, and can we fix it? Yeah. And here we could talk about, you know, some of the SEC um, regs that have been proposed, and whether these will um, sharpen our focus as investors on say on pay, um, and create more of a um, more of a signalling um, uh, opportunity for. Um, for this voting or ballot item. So I'm going to stop there. I'm going to see if anyone's typed anything into chat and just and open it up. <laughs> yeah, I didn't uh, I didn't look at chat myself, but while I'm looking at chat, no, uh, no. Let me just add, let me go back to your So the, you say that uh, the pandemic opened up the gap and it was due to, between men and women. And yes. why why is that so? Why would we, are women in industries that where the stock doesn't climb as high during a pandemic than men or any ideas there? Or, I don't, I... That's that's an interesting question, Jim. And while I talk to that, I'm going to share a I'm going to share a slide here. OK. Um, let me see. There we go. So while I talk to that, I'll just leave something to look at. Let's put right. it on slideshow. Here we go. Um, actually, this is the one I wanted. No. <laughs> That's the one I. Sorry, I'm post, taking you on I a bit of an excursion here. LinkedIn. There we go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, but so why? So here's an here's what what's obvious here is that um, the pay gap opens up with share based pay. Um, and that's restricted stock units and stock options and maybe phantom units, but you know, it's share-based pay. Um, and so what are some of the drivers of share-based pay? 
So we know that CEOs, um, as a proportion of their um, as as a proportion of their overall pay, get a lot more share based oh, pay. Oh. Um, now, women make up only a very small pr fraction of CEOs. Here we go. Let's go to this one here. Um, so the representation gap, I think, is if we're looking at um, gender, and this probably goes for um, other forms of diversity as well. But if we're looking at gender, the, re the, the representation gap is the real underlying problem here. And that is that women make up such a small fraction of CEOs that when you average this out across the C-suite, that you see that um, share-based pay is um, far higher for um, for men C-suite NEOs than for than for female uh, C-suite members. Um, and it's even higher when you proportionately. Look at, proportionately. Proportionately, yeah. yeah. And because and because CEOs are, um, you know, because if you take overall proportion of NEOs that are women, uh, that may be twenty percent. But, um, oh, sorry, 14%. But of the non-CEO NEOs, women may make up 20%, and this is in the S&P 500, but only less than 10% of CEOs. I think it's 8% of CEOs. Um, and that means that proportionately, and, and we know that CEO pay climbed disproportionately as well in 2020 because of share, you know, driven by share-based pay. So, um, so, Female representation in at the C-suite level is part of the problem, and then when you look at the breakdown of positions that women hold within this C-suite, um, what and I've done I've run these numbers before. What you see is women holding positions that tend to be they tend to have a lower proportion of share-based pay. So. Women are less represented in the COO, CFO, senior vice president roles, you know, which head up businesses with, you know, um, business heads within the organization where share-based pay is um, a lot higher and maybe they're more prevalent relatively in roles like uh, chief human resources officer, chief marketing officer, where share-based pay is um, lower as a proportion of overall pay. Ah, yes. So we're getting here to the, you know, McKinsey... Um, uh, have done an annual study of gender, uh, what is it, uh, anyway, gender in the workplace, they've, uh, they, uh, you know, they've identified that one of the biggest impediments to female advancement through the corporate ladder is that first promotion. And so, and not only that, you have, um, you have more women in some lines of, you know, women tend to be more predominant in some lines of work within an organization than in others. So where do we start by, um, you know, evening out this imbalance? Um, you know, obviously we look at uh, advancement throughout the organization. Throughout so it's, the, the, it's the, the women are in the human capital management field, whereas the men are in the, uh, I don't know, the CIO type operations or whatever i mean it's not because men are risk takers so they're willing to you know they're willing to risk it all by you know we want to go for total shareholder return and we're here to you know pump up the stock and you know make the corporation move it's more what role they're in and opportunity for stock-based compensation yeah. yes and maybe that's a negotiating um uh point as well so huh. We know from survey evidence that men are better at negotiating um, a pay package <laughs> at whatever level. Well, they're less the timid and they're more at. aggressive or whatever is. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, yes, yeah, no. one of the, uh, <clears throat> and this may apply more at the senior executive level. So, you know, there, there's um, the, the opportunity to negotiate a pay package that contains more um, share-based pay. A lot of, and just as an aside, I don't call share-based pay at-risk pay because it doesn't seem to be at risk when we look at the numbers from year to year. Um, it seems a pretty sure bet that if you have, you know, a high yes. proportion of share-based pay in your pay package, right. you're going to do pretty well. <laughs> right, right. And then you're going to look <laughs> at what are, the, what are the deliverable. Like I took, so CalPERS started voting against a, one of the questions is are pensions voting, say, on pay, are they voting them differently than they used to be. And I think they're, and you could speak to this more, but they're, they're 
it has been a, an increase. And I know at CalPERS in particular, that's the pension fund that I uh, get my retirement from, you know, they are voting against more than half of the pay packages now. And mm -hmm. uh, back a couple of, a few years ago, I, I noticed that they were voting against more. And so one of the things I went down and testified, um, I looked at, well, how is the CEO of CalPERS getting paid? And, and actually it was a person I really adored at that point, you know, who was the CEO of CalPERS. But I went down and testified against her pay package because, <laughs> because one of the elements of her pay package was she gets a 15% bonus based on meeting with constituents, you know, that Which meeting with job. stakeholders. Yeah. You know? And my, my thing was, well, if she's not meeting with stakeholders, what job is she doing? Because that's exactly. not, you know, that's, that's, that's a big part of the job. And I was told kind of behind the scenes, well, Jim, you know, the reason that we build it in that way is because it wouldn't be popular to pay her what she's actually worth in the market unless we built it into, you know, a bonus for her for doing these kinds of jobs because people, the public would look at that and say, oh, we can't pay, you know, yeah. our CEO yeah. that much. And it just felt- But if you think it's at risk, then, you know. <clears throat> yeah. 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 And there was also no, and I don't know what the CEO pay. I suspect that it's the same, especially after reading the, the book on, on uh, I forget his name, Stephen Clifford. You yeah. know, he, well, he, his book was based on an angel comes down and helps you negotiate your pay the same way that a CEO negotiates their pay, you know, and here's how much you end up earning after, yeah. after that exercise. Well, I, when I looked at the CEO pay at CalPERS, I noticed that, and it's probably the same, that there's only upside, there's no downside. There's, you know, yeah. if you do this and you do this, you get a bonus, yeah. but if you, yeah, and, and I look at that and say, well, if there's some part of my job that I get paid for and I slack off on that in order to put more emphasis on, on these things that I get a bonus for, well, that's what I'm going to do because, yes. you know, there's no, there was no takeaways. If you don't do this, we're going to take away so much from your pay. You know, there was only bonuses. Yeah, right. So what is it that you have to do to earn the bare minimum? You just have to show up yeah. you know, and that's more that, I mean, that's less than what ordinary employees are required to do. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So, so that, you know, there are, there are many ways in which that at risk component is de-risked for senior executives and CEOs. <clears throat> and, um, and so, you know, what part of the problem, and, and this is getting back to that question about how are pensions voting on, say, on pay, is, you know, how can we, you know, it's very, it's very difficult for investors, even sophisticated institutional investors, to grasp the intricacies of every pay package. I mean, and this is one of the things that pay consultants are paid for, is to help make these things <laughs> labyrinthine and, and incomprehensible so that, you know, we, we don't, we're not... We're not able to predict exactly what the um, benefits are going to be from a particular, um, you know, constellation of short term, long term, um, and all sorts of other types of um, incentives. And um, but but we do need to um, we we do need to educate ourselves as investors. That's it's imperative. We do need to start, or, or at least we need to be looking for certain guideposts in voting say on pay and that may be the problem with why say on pay has been so routinely strongly supported over the years i mean that's one of the problems overall with pay governance i would say one of the core problems with pay governance is that say on pay does not reflect the the general outrage at the growth from year to year <clears throat> and so you know it's a good it's definitely a good idea to look at how pensions are voting on pay because i think pensions are thought leaders when it comes to long termism. So, right. you know, we right. would want asset managers to be looking at pensions, to be thinking to and to be voting, taking their cues from pensions. We have had a situation where, you know, some of the largest asset managers have becoming have been becoming 
you know, be a bigger and bigger influence when it comes to vote outcomes. And if they sit on their votes, they become a bigger and bigger impediment to using say on pay as a real signal, as a as something of value. Um, and so it's imperative that the largest asset managers activate their their say on pay votes, that they actually exercise them. Because if as they grow bigger and bigger and become more and more influential over the vote, they become more and more of a barrier for other investors to be able to use their votes. Right. Um, so people are putting chat. How about just raising, how about raising your hand and let us call on you? I mean, is, that would be okay. Matthew, let's unmute you. Oh, hey, Jim. Thank you, Jackie. Um, yeah, on, Jim, you mentioned Cal, CalPERS, I think, voting against say and pay over 50% of the time. That's a huge number. I mean, that's uh, way bigger than I was expecting. Our firm, we switched from Glass Lewis to ISS, and um, we use this like template, you know, voting recommendations for social responsibility or sustainable investing. And I was kind of disappointed because Glass Lewis, I think, recommended against say on pay maybe like 15% uh, of the time. And ISS, it was like only 11 or 12% <laughs> of the time. Um, really? And that was that was the, you know, the response or the sustainable uh, recommendations. So right. I have no idea what the traditional, you know, the kind of the general recommendations are, but they're um, and several that's... standard deviations lower than what you're saying CalPERS is doing. So yeah. is, is CalPERS a big outlier or is that really where the pensions are going? And, and what does it mean to, Jackie, to your point, to leverage what the pensions are doing in the general, um, you know, in, amongst asset managers? I'm, I'm with an asset manager. Work, we work with uh, churches and faith-based institutions. Jackie's got the numbers. Well, yeah. I mean, to be honest, right now, I don't have the numbers for pensions oh. in front of me because we don't know. Um, yeah, pensions yeah. aren't routinely required to disclose their proxy votes. Right. But, I mean, this brings us to another interesting point, and that is that the, that the SEC has proposed that, that any um, institutional investment manager um, with over 100 million in assets, in other words, anybody who files a 13F, will be required or would be required if these rules are passed to disclose how they vote on say on pay and so we could end up with a lot more transparency into how fiduciaries are exercising their votes on this and and potentially be able to compare more routinely how pension funds and asset managers vote um, how different types of asset managers i mean i talk about asset managers but look at trillium they vote almost 100 percent, if not 100 percent of the time against Right. against the say on pay i mean for them the system is broken so yeah, yeah. you know they why support any of these resolutions so you know they they and and the say on pay is an interesting you know it's not like maybe one when i've looked at the numbers before just across asset managers you know american funds they tend to not be very um supportive of um of shareholder resolutions for instance, especially on environmental and social issues, neither um, dimensional. Um, but when you look at their votes on, on say, on pay, they actually end up being a lot more aggressive than um, you know, uh, State Street or you know some of the others. So it's an interesting to compare. You know, they have different approaches to corporate accountability, and and that's one of the interesting things that stands out. Um, that all asset managers are not equal when it comes to how they vote on, on say, on pay, um, and that asset managers are changing their stance. Uh, even the largest asset managers were more ready to vote against management in 2021 um, based on 2020 pay practices. And this may be a trend that continues now, you know. So that's why I say I think it is there is a bit of a warning sign in this incremental decrease in support that that's come that's definitely not passed companies by um well, i find it really disheartening that iss and glass lewis recommend against so few and i think yes. and because i also think that a lot of the reason that people hire those you know that you look for a proxy advisor is say on pay is a labyrinth and you don't want to have to you know you want to depend on the experts to figure it reminds me when i was uh 
a lobbyist. I was the legislative advocate for our department, and I would go over to the Capitol and we'd write bills, and there would be like 12 representatives from the chemicals and other industries, and we'd be sitting around writing these bills, but the attorneys that would write the bills, they would write them in such a way that you'd have to hire them in order to figure out what the bill says, you know, and there'd be like one poor person from, you know, the National Resources Defense Council or something, you know, looking through a 150 page bill trying to figure out, okay, subparagraph three, you know, how does that relate to the maze, you know, so, uh, Tracy, let's unmute you. Yeah. Um <clears throat> Okay, so a couple of thoughts before I before I put in my two cents on, on the glass loose and ISS thing, Matthew, you're you're completely right. I when I was at Florida, I'm I'm at the Council of Institutional Investors now, but I was at Florida State Board for a very long time. And exactly what you saw, 15% and eleven percent. So maybe the, the E and the S differs for other, you know, factors outside of the compensation votes. I, I suspect that's probably it. But either way, you know, I'd read those analyses and they they would contain all this like negative information at the end, they'd say, but we're gonna vote for it. Um, I do think CalPERS is, is an outlier in that respect. Um, you know, at Florida, it's funny cause I'd, I'd worked there for several years, left for a couple of years, it came back for several years. And in the time period when I left, our state on pay approval rate went way up and then came way back down when I got back. Um, I, I, there's a few pension funds and a few asset managers. Dimensional is one that does a really good job of um, of looking at comp. And I, I think that the, the problem with Glasgow and ISS, if I can say it that way, and with a lot of the asset managers and, and pension funds is that they look at this as though they're grading on a curve. And so they really are looking for those sandwich, you know, top, top and bottom ends. And I don't think that that's the way that we can do this, um, partly because pay is so st systemic. Um, you know, there's comp consultants that sort of like the problems that they that they cause become endemic. And so everybody adopts them. Um, so unfortunately, those are outliers, but I, but it is getting a little bit better. I just wanted to throw out, you know, it's such a great topic, it's such a long topic, but the use of ESG metrics and compensation, we see we see some proposals for that now and a lot of companies disclosing that they're doing that. And that makes me really worried because we haven't even gotten good disclosure of the financial <laughs> metrics. Uh -huh. And I just feel like it's another way of saying like, it, it's just another lever they can toggle and say like, well, the, the performance was really bad. I mean, Jackie, you, you alluded to this earlier. We did a study um, years ago at Florida showing the exact same thing. The things that drove pay, the sensitivity to pay were the size of the company and the industry performance, whether we measured it by TSR or financial metrics like net income, it, it just wasn't variable. It, the pay once it's set is very, very sticky. So in bad years, it's high. And in good years, it's higher. <laughs> it's not that much higher. Do you know what I mean? Like the sensitivity of, of pay to performance is very, very low. Um, so I don't know. I just, there's no, no, no answers here. Just complaints. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. You know, Tracy, I, I think that's a really good point about ESG metrics is that, you know, we, we need to, so, I mean, on the one hand, we now, you know, we know that companies long term performance and we're thinking and really we need to think beyond three or five years, you know, we long term performance, we need to be thinking 2050. So what are the drivers of long term performance? These are E and S. So we have to somehow find a way to pin performance evaluations to E and S. We're getting a little close. I mean, today we have the, you know, the uh, climate risk disclosure proposal by the SEC. This is going to further standardize um, disclosures by companies, um, also tighten the metrics and introduce very, you know, very um, auditing requirements over certain of the emissions. So, you know, we're, we're making, we're, we're getting closer to where we can compare one company to another on, on, on objective metrics on ESG, you know, so we're not Whereas in the past, you know, that has been more of a, or we've always thought of ESG as more qualitative. So it is important, whatever metrics we use, they have to be observable, measurable. Um, we have to be able to, to um, hold companies to the, to the performance standards that they set and hold companies accountable for changing those performance standards mid-flight, like they did during the pandemic. Um, now, um, 
one of the um, yeah so observable you know but this doesn't but but because of the complexities of of introducing ESG metrics, I don't think we have we should throw the baby out of the bathwater because the alternative is we start we stick to the financial metrics, which are part of the problem up until now anyway. You know, because share based pay is really pinned to financial metrics, and and the financial metrics are usually measured over shorter periods of time than we than we as investors saving for our retirements or whatever. Then we are concerned about you know we're concerned about the long term, really long term. Okay. And, you know, now we've got, like, if, if you look at companies, we've got science, if, if we look at the heaviest emitters, we've got science-based targets that take us all the way to 2050 and beyond. Why can we not pin, um, you know, sectoral decarb science-based targets based on sectoral decarbonization pathways? Why can we not pin um, CEO and senior executive pay to these targets? They're objectively, scientifically verified targets that you know, you can pin whether you pin short term or long term incentives to them they they track on a long term to 2050 they make ideal targets for performance evaluation i have a question the uh you know it was it was funny you were relating uh, uh ceos to rock stars and which is also to say that that you know we, we've seen distortion in pay uh, it, outside of just CEOs, including uh, those in entertainment and those in uh, in sports, yeah. etc. Um, but I, you know, it's been a while since I've sat on a board, and uh, uh, you know, Jim has said this in the past too. Uh, generally, we would get a, uh, a a hay report, and we'd put the C, we'd look at the various quartiles and put the CEO in one. And, but it would all be relative to another CEO with respect to this market and it effectively became self-sustaining. But at least it was always tied to the vesting and the grants were always tied to operating and financial performance targets, not stock price targets, which has been the shift that we've seen. Um, you know, for a while now and then most recently with these moonshot grants, et cetera. Have you looked uh, at the numbers in terms of how much um, of this uh, of, of the stock price generated wealth has been responsible for uh, for the gap, um, and that's really just a function of, of of beta more than anything else. How the market has done over the last ten years, not necessarily a, a, the result of of uh, the, what the CEO may or may not be doing. And you know, if I, the last ten years has been fantastic from a market per, uh, performance perspective, uh, the next 10 years may not be so, uh, and, and curious as to what that, that may or may not do to the num numbers. So a, a little bit to unpack there, but if you've got some comments, I'd be interested. Yeah, you know, to be honest, I haven't done um, a lot of um, digging into the relationship between pay and share price performance. Um, if you look at the reading list that I present, that you know that I shared right early on, I'd look at um, Fish et al., uh, Jill Fish, and um, co-authors. They they delved into that question, and they do find that pay is more linked to share price performance than it is to fundamentals. Whether those fundamentals are based on financial metrics or anything else, or you know um, how they how the pay is structured. But that's what they find, and and what they find as well, and so of course they link this to say on pay, and they so they find that um, say on pay is say on pay goes down, or, or companies get penalised when their share price underperforms. Right. Uh, <clears throat> but that's uh, yeah, but that's the only. I mean, I have to read this again, um, and I, I would reference this article, but they don't get penalised. Um, for other types of pay practices. Mm -hmm. So it's only when the share price underperforms. And I think we've seen a bit of this. Huh. And that's not necessarily underperforms relative to peers. I think it's just when the share price goes down. When shareholders lose money, then they start looking at, say, on pay. Okay, there's a question here from Nicole Lee who says she's got construction going on, so she can't unmute herself. So I'm going to say, uh, so thanks for touching on the at-risk issue. I've wondered many times whether companies emphasize that that phrase because it's something suggests 
that executives face more risk in their compensation than they actually do, which I think we have uh, touched on. Could you also share your thoughts on the payment of dividends or even the accrual of dividends equivalents on awards that have not yet vested, whether PSUs or RSUs? Hmm, that's getting that's, a little that's, that's, beyond yeah, that's my expertise. <laughs> right. Yeah, that is in the weeds. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so um, <clears throat> well, I'm going to have to pass on that because I'd have to give that a lot more thought, I think, than maybe we have time for here, and I'd have to research that as well because it's yeah. not not really something I've looked at. Interesting yeah. question. Yeah. Uh, um, okay. Well, we are getting towards the end of the, of the time frame, and... Uh, I did have a question or two in my brain, but I can't bring them back here. Um, I'll hit it. It's usually built into the long-term structure. This is uh, Nicole again. It's usually built into the long-term structure, but I see the numbers in the summary comp table that are sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars. Huh. From, uh, from the dividends, eh? Um, in the summary comp? I don't know. Yeah, I haven't I haven't noticed that. I'll have to pay more attention. I mean, one thing that I'm looking at that I've, you know, been introducing proposals is to, you know, which I don't know if it's going to just exacerbate things, but, you know, I'm asking, I'm getting eventually towards a CEO to, to a worker stock, um, you know, ratio you know because the neos they get the majority of the stocks that the that the that the um, owners have to you know the uh, share owners have to vote on you know they have to we have to they have to go out to the share owners ask for permission to set aside a bunch of stock and uh and we never really find out where that stock goes. We see it re reported to the NEOs, but if there's anything that goes lower, we don't see it. And so, and you know, these CEOs are getting rich off of the appreciation in stock. And I, I guess one of the things is when I talked to Amazon about, and of course they did a no action, they did all kinds of stuff to try to get out of revealing. And her response back to me was, well, we surveyed our employees and they they decided that they wanted pay instead of stock, you know, and of course that's and instead of because if you're not earning a living wage, yeah. <laughs> then of course you need, to get, you need to get that living wage first before you yeah. get that stock, you know, and of course CEOs you know the you know the after the rule came out a long time ago, you know, basically you get a million dollars, you know, and then your incentive pay is built on top of that. So they, their living wage is a million dollars a year. And then on top of that, they get all this incentive pay. So, yeah. you know, at Amazon, well, they, of course, they need a living wage first, and then they need to get stock on top of that. But anyway, I just... Yeah, yeah, that's true. Throwing that out. Let's see. That's it, I guess, for the comments in the chat. And... Uh, I guess there we're ending it. Good. Well, on that, on a final note, I will just, you know, just we for, for us all to consider, you know, what can we do to activate, say, on pay? I mean, I think this is a big question. This is a big question that I've been grappling with. We have this proxy ballot real estate. It's called, say, on pay. And year after year, it becomes a rubber stamp. And... You know, we we really need to think strategically. Um, those of us in you know in close to proxy voting, those of us concerned about corporate accountability, those of us concerned about stewardship, we need to think about how we can activate um, say on pay because it's there. I mean, it's um, if if we don't, you know, the risk is it it just carries on being a rubber stamp and and um, you know and serving the the ever widening gap between CEO and an ordinary worker pay. So, um, so, you know, I'll just leave everyone with that thought is, you know, what can we do?
And, and I'll, I'll leave people with the thought that Jackie is probably reporting on this issue more than anyone else because you put out tables all the time showing, okay, here's how these funds voted on, say, on pay and other issues as well, but and compare that to how the big four are voting or other funds, and you can see sometimes there's a phenomenal difference there. And I'm, you know, I think both of us and many of us are hoping that once, but you know, not everybody reads Jackie's columns. <laughs> That's one of the problems. <laughs> I don't you know, expect that, everyone to read my columns. <laughs> that that but, once, once those NPX, you know, requirements are kicked in, mm -hmm. hopefully there'll be many more reports and people, and you will always be ahead of the game because you have such a, you know, if, if there's a marathon, you're, you know, 20 miles out where the other people are just getting started. So you'll be able to report and do comparisons that other people, you know, or have just will just dream of. And, you know, we will see, hopefully we'll see funds competing on how those funds yeah, yeah. vote. Because, I, you know, you think about what disturbs the, the general population out there about corporate governance or CEOs or whatever. And the only thing I ever really hear, hardly, uh, most of the time, is CEO pay. You know, yeah. why are they paid a hundred million dollars in a year? You know, they just, and that just irks people. And then if you see how your pension or your four hundred one k or whatever, how those folks are voting, maybe they scream to those folks about it. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah, the pressure, the visibility. That's all. You know, and there's a question here, what is the timeline for the updated MPX reporting requirements? I mean, I, I don't think we have a timeline yet. The consultation yeah, yeah. has closed, you know, everybody who wanted to have a say on the proposed rules um, has had their say. And now we just wait for the SEC. And of course, it's not going to be this year that we see those um, disclosure requirements, um, you know, actually producing disclosures, but um, hopefully in time for next year. Well, hopefully they'll come and actually vote on it, right? Vote on a final rule. Here's a yes, rule exactly, that we want exactly, yes. vote on. So, well, it's not even the final rule. It'll be a rule that has comments, right? Because that you're- Oh, oh so no, that's the process, the yeah, you, yeah. yeah. Vote on the final rule. Yeah. Okay, so we've still got a bit of a ways to go. Yeah, yeah. Okay. thanks, Jim. For confusing us once again. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you, <laughs> thank you, Jackie. Uh, I've had a great time. And, uh, I have as well. Thanks. Thank you. And thanks, thanks for the so great questions. Real right. thought provoking questions.